We can hear you clearly. Okay, so we are going to start the session. Good afternoon to you all. I warmly welcome you all to this uh, exciting uh, event, case-based discussion in chemical pathology, which will be held for this month of April, organized by the College of Chemical Pathologists of Sri Lanka. Uh, today, the cases will be presented by the chemical pathology team at LRH. Uh, the first case presentation is uh, Vitamin Can Do Magic. Uh, presented by Dr. Krishanjali Ranmuthapura and Dr. A. Dayani. And the second case, second case presentation is Mysterious Cases of Low Soul, which will be presented by Dr. Nishani De Silva and Dr. Vika Fernando. So uh, this is going to be a mixture of uh, vitamins and souls for your lunch during lunch time. And the discussion will be conducted by Dr. Iresha Jasana. Uh, consultant chemical pathologist, Lady Rejoy Hospital for Children. And uh, I would like to bring to your notice that there will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. And during the, while the presentations are going on, if you have any questions, So we've lost Dr. Dilanti. So we will take up the questions at the end. So over to you, uh, Dr. Kishanjali. Thank you, madam. Good afternoon, all of you. Let's start with our first case. Case one, a 13 month old previously healthy baby boy presented with vomiting and altered level of consciousness for two days duration. There was a history of fever and cough for three days prior to this presentation. He developed dystonia and quadriparesis during illness and there were no history of trauma to head, no convulsions, no diarrhea and child was not on fasting. Family history, he is the third born child to consanguineous parents and there was a history of sibling death at age of five months due to a similar presentation. He has a seven years old healthy male sibling. Um, birth history, child delivered by normal vaginal delivery at term with the birth weight of 2.87 kilogram with uneventful postnatal history. Um, Past medical history and the drug history was not significant and development he is age appropriate and immunization history is up to date. During examination, child had mild dehydration and he was lethargic and noticed acidotic breathing with GCS of 13 by 15 and system systemic examination was unremarkable. Investigations, uh, investigation findings uh, were compatible with uh, ketotic hypoglycemia with high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And uh, renal and liver functions were normal with high plasma ammonia and lactate levels. MRI brain showed high signal T2 flare in bilateral globus pallidum, which was suggestive of a metabolic stroke secondary to organic acidemia. Here, the findings of MRI brain. In summary, uh, previously well child presented with vomiting and altered level of consciousness following respiratory tract infection. Initial findings suggestive of ketotic hypoglycemia with high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Uh, differential diagnosis considered, uh, we gave the first priority for organic acidemia and uh, considered uh, pyruvate carboxylase deficiency also as a differential diagnosis as this child had high lactic acid and uh, presented with metabolic acidosis and uh, glycogen storage dis disorders were in, at last in our differential diagnosis because this extent of metabolic acidosis is not usually seen 
in children with glycogen storage disorders. Then we proceeded with uh, performing plasma amino acid profile, which showed mild elevation in leucine and valine. The file. Uh, here is uh, the chromatogram is. Uh, We can appreciate uh, mild to moderate lactic acid and ketotic markers of uh, three hydroxy and butyric acid, acetoacetate. And uh, there is a uh, marked elevation in methyl malonic acid and mild amount of triglyceride and methyl citrate. Uh, above markers confirm the diagnosis of methyl malonic acid urea by urine organic acid profile. Uh, the child was managed uh, with IV dextrose and bicarbonate to correct hypoglycemia and metabolic acidosis based on our uh, diagnosis given in the urine organic acid profile. Child was uh, started with uh, empirically uh, with thiamine, biotin, carnitine, and vitamin B12. For dystonia, child was given benzexol, levodopa, and clonazepam. Uh, after the acute stage, uh, child was given low protein diet and weekly vitamin B12 injection. Child was discharged after five weeks, and dis but dystonia was persisted. Uh, we proceeded with mutation analysis, which showed homozygous nonsense pathogenic mutation in MMAA gene, which confirms the genetic diagnosis of autosomal recessive vitamin B12 responsive methyl malonic acid urea. Uh, we performed serum vitamin B12 and plasma homocysteine level in our ch child. It was normal. Uh, here is uh, here some images of our ch child, uh, child before acute illness and child during illness with severe dystonia and a child before discharge. They have a marked improvement uh, of our child. Uh, after the acute illness. Uh, methyl malonic acidemia, it is an autosomal recessive disorder of amino acid metabolism, which is caused by a deficiency of methyl malonyl CoA mutase enzyme, or a defect in transport or synthesis of its cofactor, which is adenosyl cobalamine, and a deficiency of methyl malonyl CoA epimerase enzyme. Uh, here, we can appreciate the pathway of formation of succinyl CoA, which is the intermediate of citric. Which is the intermediate of uh, citric acid cycle. And uh, L methyl malonyl CoA uh, is formed from the catabolism of valine, isoleucine, threonine. In many acids, cholesterol side chains, and propionic acid. Uh, it is converted to D-methyl malonyl CoA by propionyl CoA carboxylase, which is biotin-dependent enzyme. And uh, D-methyl uh, malonyl CoA is converted to L-methyl malonyl CoA by methyl malonyl CoA racemase enzyme. And uh, L-methyl malonyl CoA enzyme is converted CoA is converted to succinyl CoA by methyl malonyl CoA mutase. Uh, this uh, enzyme is dependent on adenosyl cobalamine, which is the cofactor for the enzyme. And uh, our child had defect in MMA gene, which is uh, which which is the gene uh, in involving formation of cobalamine A. So that our child had increased methyl malonyl CoA, methyl malonic acid, propionyl CoA. 3 hydropionic acid and methyl citrate, uh, and also valine in amino acid profile. There are two types of methyl malonic acid. Uh, first one is isolated methyl malonic acidemia. Uh, there are two types unresponsive to vitamin B12 therapy, uh, which is due to mutation in methyl malonyl. 
Uh, vitamin B12 therapy uh, when there is a defect in synthesis of adenosyl cobalamin as in our child and the second form is combined methylmalonic acidemia and homocysteine urea. Our take home message is uh, organic acidemia should be suspected when a child present uh, with sudden onset deterioration with ketotic hypoglycemia and high anion gap metabolic acidosis and performing of urine organic acid profile will be helpful in diagnosing treatable conditions till confirm the diagnosis by mutation analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Krisha. Uh, and the same topic regarding vitamins can do magic. This is the second case uh, where is a child presented with uh, she's seizures and skin lesion. Uh, this child is a firstborn baby boy born to a third degree consanguineous parents with a normal growth and developmental history. Uh, when his history, the birth was uncomplicated with a normal uh, birth weight and no antenatal complication. Uh, but at day six of life, mother observed an on and off jitteriness, but it was not investigated or no medical advice was taken. But as a continuation of that, at day 10 of life, the baby had fever. And at that moment, it was uh, treated as a neonatal sepsis. After that, again, child was thriving well, but at the age of two months, after the vaccination, the child developed febrile seizures. And after the, that episode, the child repeatedly had the seizure episodes. So while the examination, the growth parameters were normal, uh, no obvious Respirate no abnormalities, and in CNS examination, generalized hypotonia was noted. And the remarkable sign with uh, was the skin lesion, which was suggestive of an acrodermatitis. So, uh, this was the this was our child on presentation. Uh, these were the skin lesions noted, and the, it was uh, at on clinical diagnosis. It was given as an acrodermatitis. And when the basic investigation panel was requested, the full blood count shows chromic normocytic anemia and normal liver and renal function. In view of seizures and fever, the CSF analysis was performed and it was normal and no document and hypoglycemia is noted. Uh, and the second panel of investigation, the abnormality detectors was a very high plasma lactate with high uric acid. But unfortunately, the coexisting uh, ABG finding suggestive of acidosis is not available. And the plasma ammonia was normal with the positive ketone bodies. So the next panel of investigations uh, were lined up with the investigating the cause for the underlying very high levels of plasma lactate. Uh, meanwhile, parallelly, the imaging studies of uh, ultrasound brain revealed the subdural space widening and the CT brain cerebral atrophy and a widened extra axial CSF space with a normal EEG. So, uh, so the next was the third tier investigation with urine organic acid profile. Uh, supported with a very high lactic acid peak compared to the internal standard with the markers of uh, ketosis and such as 3-hydroxybutyric and acetoacetate. Apart from that, we could find 3-hydroxypropionic acid, 3-methylcrotonylglycine, 3-hydroxyisovaleric acid, and a very huge peak of 3-hydroxyisovaleric acid. So in view of this organic acid profile, uh, the presence of above markers uh, suggestive of a multiple carboxylase deficiency, either due to a biotinidase deficiency or holocarboxylase synthetase deficiency 
uh, <coughs> was suspected and we suggested to perform biotinidase level to find out the etiology for the multiple carboxylase deficiency. Um, <coughs> so uh, with the clinical suspicious and the supportive urine organic acid profile, further evaluation of ammonia acid profile and the nasal carnitine profile, which was performed in an overseas laboratory, also supported the diagnosis of biotinidase deficiency with low enzyme level of 15.84, uh, support, further supported with the elevated 3-hydroxy isovaleryl carnitine levels. Mm, so uh, in management part, the child was treated with meningoencephala, treated for meningoencephala, Kephalitis with IV antibiotic and started on oral biotic. And later on, for the seizures, child was followed up to neurology clinic and seizure frequency was reduced and re remarkable improvement in the skin lesions was noted after the commencement of oral biotic. So the repeated organic acid profile showed the absence of previously detected markers and the child is now thriving well. So this is this was the child's image at the clinical presentation with generalized involvement of the skin lesion. And this image shows one month after the starting start commencement of biotin with uh, marked improvement in the skin lesion with uh, hair growth. So this was the repeat organic acid profile, which was performed after one month of biotin therapy. Obviously, you can demonstrate that the absence of the markers detected in the previous organic acid profile. So in discussion, biotinidase deficiency is an autosomal recessive condition, uh, which is caused by a defect in the BTD gene, which encodes for the biotinidase enzyme. Here, because of, uh, because of this enzyme de defect, we are, the body is unable to recycle biotin and uh, there is a defect in all biotinidase dependent carboxylases. So you know, this is to briefly explain the biotin cycle. So in our body, you know, the free biotin is either um, derived from the dietary factors or from recycled biotin inside the body, which is important for the formation of holocarboxylase, production of the holocarboxylase synthase enzyme. So in view of, so this biotin, again, recycled by biotinidase and maintain the free, free, free pool of biotin in the body at a constant level. So if the biotinidase is deficient here, the free biotin pool cannot be maintained and both the synthesis of either holocarboxylase synthase is affected or the synthesis is adequate, but the, uh, as biotin is not available, the enzyme activity is not available because the core factor of biotin is missing. Uh, so, so one of the enzyme dependent on biotin is the propionyl CoA carboxylase. When there is a block in this place, so the, there is accumulation of propionyl CoA in blood, and these are the markers relevant, particular to the propionyl CoA is elevated in bloodstream and can be detected in the urine. So, which was the three hydroxypropionic acid is elevated in our patient. In same as three methyl crotonyl CoA. Carboxylase is another biotin-dependent enzyme, which is again defective here because of the biotin, inadequate biotin. And again, it will lead to the elevation of following markers that also detected in our child with 3 hydroxy isovaleric acid and the 3 methyl crotonyl glycine. Similarly, the pyroid carboxylase, the other enzyme which is dependent on biotin. So there is a block in conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate in turn lead of, to accumulation of pyrate and lactate, so which lead to very high levels of lactic acid in turn presented in the urine organic acid profile also. So with the conclusion, <coughs> with all these findings suggestive of, for um, possibility of biotin, uh, biotin dependent carboxylase deficiency with a low biotinidase enzyme activity concluded the diagnosis of biotinidase deficiency. Usually, the presentation, depending on the degree of enzyme defect, the child usually present as skin lesion, seizures, 
alopecia, hypotonia, some with hyperventilation and laryngeal strido, hearing impairment and visual problems. Usually the profound enzyme deficient patients will have more muscular involvement with myopathies and distal axonal polyneuropathy. Biochemically, they will present it with lactic acidosis, organic aciduria, and can be a mild hyperammonemia. So the diagnosis mainly rely on clinical suspicious and urine organic acids, and this can be supported by the acyl carnitine profile finding and biotinidase levels, which can be performed in a peripheral leukocytes in a dry blood spot assay, but the confirmatory diagnosis can be achieved by genetic confirmation. So the take-home message is uh, that should be a high clinical suspicion of biotinidase deficiency in a child with seizures, mainly with skin lesions, and the available investigation for the diagnosis in our setting with a low cost, and it is freely available treatment with oral biotin, an excellent prognosis with over, um, prognosis with proper treatment as noted in our child. Thank you. So the discussion will be continued by our madam. Thank you, Dara, Shanjali, and Tayanani for selecting these two patients. It's vitamin, response, vitamin responsive rare disorders. So, as you are aware, the trainees who have worked at LRH, you know that vitamin responsive rare diseases are not that uncommon. The first case, which was discussed by Dr. Pisanjali, is a cobalamin dependent case. And what is cobalamin? It's B12. It's a cobalt containing micronutrient and which is synthesized by microorganisms, but it is essential to human health. So the deficiency of B12 can uh, present with different phenotypic presentations and they can be due to clusters. Actually, clusters can be either vitamin B12 metabolism, is bioavailability, cytoplasmic transport, remethylation, or mitochondrial cluster. So this case presented by Dr. Kisanjari belongs to the mitochondrial, mitochondrial cluster and it's good that they had a Good diagnosis, the cobalamin A dependent methylmalic acid urea, which is can be treated with B12. The second case, the Kayanis case, the biotin is deficient. He actually, Professor Barry Wolf, the eminent professor who has worked a uh, lot of research, he has performed a lot of research on biotin days and has published many research papers. He says if you have to have an inherited metabolic disease, this is the one to have. It's a neurocutaneous disorder. You can remember the, our patient's clinical presentation. So it's easy, easy for the clinician to diagnose when the child presents with neurological manifestations as well as dermatological evidence. But this is not always occurred. So therefore, the, there's a role played by the chemical pathologist in diagnosing this sort of rare diseases by analyzing urine for organic acids. It's over to you, uh, Hisham. Thank you. After going through two interesting cases based on how vitamin can do miracles. Now we, we are going to move on to our second topic, mysterious salt loss. Uh, the, I'm going to present the case number one. Uh, the presentation of this case is a two-month-old baby boy with the first product of consanguineous marriage delivered by emergency lower section cesarean section due to lack of progression with good birth weight, which is uh, 3.2 kilograms. Uh, the current presentation was fever, cough, and cold for one month duration associated with reduced breastfeeding, but there is no uh, vomiting or diarrhea or reduced urine output noticed. Uh, but uh, since birth, 
uh, the, the there was a failure to thrive uh, and the patient's current weight was 3.1 kilogram which was slow below the child's birth weight uh, after admission the examination finding revealed uh, fever and uh, reduce uh, oxygen saturation on air it was 88 and with oxygen therapy it was improved to 100 and there's a tachypnea and a tachycardia with normal blood pressure the rest of the investigation find systemic investigation findings were normal and then uh, uh, the basic investigation reveals uh, neutrophilia on full blood count uh, but uh, renal function, liver function, and calcium magnesium levels were normal. The serum electrolyte levels revealed marked hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, and hyperchloremia, which was uh, repeatedly confirmed in the PCUN ward. Then, uh, due to the very low electrolyte levels, venous blood glass was performed, which revealed metabolic calculosis with partial respiratory compensation evidenced by pH of 7.6, carbon dioxide of 60 and bicarbonate level of 54 with 33 base excess. As a summary, this is a two-month-old baby boy with the background history of failure to thrive presented with features of lower respiratory tract infection and reduced feeding and found to have uh, severe hyponatremia hyperkalemia and hypochloremic metabolic calculosis. So the differential diagnosis made by the clinical, clinical team was salt loss in tubulopathy, Barter syndrome and pseudobarter syndrome. Uh, the monitoring uh, saw to exclude or confirm the above differential diagnosis, further uh, workup was done, which included monitoring of input-output chart, which revealed no polyuria uh, dehydration and the, as there is very marked hyperkalemia, hypernatremia and hypochloremia, the serum electrolyte, electrolyte was supplemented with IVs, 3% sodium chloride and IV KCL uh, and then the, even though the urinary electro, baseline urinary electrolytes were planned uh, it was not done before starting serum uh, electrolyte supplementations uh, but uh, after the sub, uh, electrolyte supplementation, uh, the urinary electrolyte was performed in a spot urine sample, which revealed sodium level of 31, potassium, urinary potassium level of 26, and chloride level of 28. And then uh, in a spot urine sample, uh, urinary magnesium to creatinine ratio and calcium to creatinine ratio was done, which both were normal. Uh, and child had normal renal functions. And uh, ultrasound scan of the kidney ureter bladder did not show any medullary nephrocalcinosis and uh, angiotensin renin ratio was planned. Uh, so when considering all the investigation, examination and history, clinical history, the, the for and against factors for Barter syndrome and other soil loss in tubulopathy uh, was uh, considered. For the Barter syndrome, the four, fact, uh, the four points for in this patient is presence of hyperkalemia and hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, which is almost present in most of the barter patients. And uh, they are also usually presented with failure to thrive as in this patient. And the, being the product of consanguineous parent is also for factor for barter syndrome because it's a autosomal recessive, barter syndrome is autosomal recessive inheritance. The against factors for barter syndrome was there was usually they present with uh, uh, hypercalciuria uh, and uh, associated with medullary nephrocalcinosis and uh, this patient doesn't have those findings and usually the Bart syndrome patients present with uh, very high urinary electrolyte loss but uh, in this case we didn't have the baseline urinary electrolyte levels uh, but uh, the available one doesn't also show uh, doesn't also much doesn't show very marked urinary electrolyte losses and uh, within uh, electrolyte supplementations the patient's serum electrolyte become normal uh, became normal so that is also a against feature for Barter syndrome because most of the it's very difficult to uh, normalize uh, electrolyte levels with uh, 
even with IV uh, electrolyte replacement. And there is no associated facial dysmorphism or sensor neural deafness in this patient, which is seen, seen in some uh, type of uh, Barter syndromes. And also other tibulopathies, thought loss in tibulopathies, which could be drug induced or other um, um, uh, inherited tibulopathies. Uh, also considers in this patient the four factors for these uh, to consider these tibulopathies are also same the presence of hyperkalemia and hypochloromic metabolic alkalosis with failure to thrive the uh, against features for uh, in this patient are presence of polyuria uh, this patient doesn't have polyuria or polydipsia and their uh, the blood pressure was normal. Usually, the uh, these tibulopathy patient present with B blood pressure abnormalities, uh, and, um, and also the, the in these patients the renal functions were usually altered. But in our patient, the renal functions were normal, and uh, there is no other associated uh, tubular losses like glycosuria, proteinuria, hypercalciuria in this patient. Uh, so we left with the diagnosis of pseudobarter syndrome and set testing was performed to uh, confirm or through the diagnosis. The set chloride levels by, uh, done by coulometric titration method reveal uh, 102 mil cl chloride level of 102 millimoles per liter, which is high above the uh, 65 doses cutoff of 60. Uh, so the... So the diagnosis was made as pseudobarter syndrome due to cystic fibrosis. Uh, when considering the cystic fibrosis, it's usually due to a defective cystic fibrosis uh, uh, transmembrane conductor regulator G, uh, protein, which, which, which usually involves in, uh, absorption of chlorides and, and low anion like chloride and uh, bicarb into the epithelial cells. Uh, when there is a defective uh, CFTR protein, the absorption of uh, chloride along with bicarbonate is uh, impaired in ep epithelial cells, including sweat glands. So there is a marked loss of sodium chloride in sweat occurs. And uh, this can lead to uh, hypernatremia and hypochloremia. And also, uh, when there is a marked loss in sodium chloride in sweat, the, so the sodium chloride levels in the extracellular fluid is depleted, which can uh, com activate compensatory redding and aldosterone and geotensin system. And as a result of that activation, there will be compensatory sodium reabsorption and distilled convoluted tubules with the uh, compensatory increase in potassium and hydrogen excretion and collect index. So the overall uh, effect will be a metabolic alkalosis with hyperkalemia along with the hyponatremia and hypochloremia. Uh, uh, all, all, uh, all the features were evident in our patients uh, confirming the diagnosis of pseudobarter syndrome. So after diagnosis, the patient was managed with shared care uh, given by the pediatrician, pediatric pulmonologist, and nutrition team. They have started pancreatic enzyme supplementation along with fat-soluble vitamins like ADEK and salt supplementation with sodium chloride and KCL and prophylaxis antibiotic for respiratory infections and chest physiotherapy. Uh, with the above management, patient was clinically well improved and appropriate weight gain was achieved during the hospital stay. Uh, when considering the pseudobarter syndrome and barter syndrome, the barter syndrome is usually due to defective renal handling of electrolyte at thick ascending loop of Henle involving sodium potassium <coughs> chloride channels, ROMK channels at chloride channels, and also a subunit of chloride channel non Bartian uh, receptors. And uh, so the loss of chloride, uh, loss of uh, electrolytes in urine is evident with the uh, marked urinary chloride levels. And the sweat chloride levels were usually normal uh, in these barter patients. So, compared to pseudobarter syndrome, where the defective cystic fibrosis, defective cystic fibrosis, defective leading to loss of sodium chloride.
chloride gas sets. Thus, uh, there will be very high so, uh, sweat chloride levels in the pseudobarter patients. And whereas the, uh, as there is a loss of sodium chloride in less sweat, there would, there would be compensatory absorption of electrolyte in renal tubules with the very low urinary electrolyte levels, which would be usually low, well, urinary electrolyte will be low or normal. So uh, be, performing a urinary electrolyte level as a baseline investigation can easily differentiate these two uh, syndromes at the beginning of the uh, workup. Uh, unexplainable metabolic alkalosis and low serum electrolyte levels, cystic fibrosis should also be included in the differential diagnosis list, even in the top down, because it's uh, it, 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 there's presentation with pseudobarter syndrome noticed in literature. Uh, and for forming a urinary electrolyte levels before starting the serum electrolyte supplementation, supplementation is important uh, to differentiate the two condition at the basic in at the by doing basic investigations thank you thank you dr nishani i will be presenting the second case uh, also involving hyponatremia so this is a report we received uh, at the lab it's of a two month old male child who was referred from the pediatric general medical ward and uh, we noted a severe hyponatremia, and there was also a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia noted with normal uh, renal function. When inquiring the history from the ward, uh, they said that this is, was the child of a firstborn. This is a firstborn child born to non consanguineous parents. Who presented with the child had a background of failure to thrive and there was a mild hepatic megaly and his records showed uh, image to investigate the cause for severe hyponatremia we first checked for the non-hypotonic causes of hyponatremia like hyperglycemia hyperproteinemia and hypertriglyceridemia so for that, for that, first we investigated the sample. Then we noted that the sample was uh, had a milky appearance and also the lipemic index was six, which was equivalent to the triglyceride levels of intralipid of uh, 11.3 to 33.9. So then we performed the triglyceride levels, which were markedly high and uh, with a normal cholesterol level. So since the serum was milk in appearance, we again reanalyzed the general biochemistry after centrif centrifugation. We took the infrared and analyzed. So there we saw that uh, the general chemistry findings differed. Some analytes increased like creatinine and certain and direct bilirubin and certain analytes decreased. And the uh, patient had uh, normal serum amylase levels. And the markedly low sodium level uh, in the post ultra centrifuge sample uh, direct analysis showed 132. And, uh, <clears throat> and also the child had normal TSH level and uh, he was normoglycemic. So with those in background, with that very high triglyceride levels, we were thinking of a primary cause. And so we proceeded with genetic analysis. So uh, with the help of an overseas lab, the mutational analysis revealed two heterozygous variants, one pathogenic and another one likely pathogenic, uh, confirming the diagnosis of lipoprotein lipase deficiency. So brief discussion of the case. So when investigating hyponatremia, first excluding the causes of non-hypotonic ones would be easier in our setting. And uh, if you are following an algorithm, uh, that's one of the initial steps. So uh, like causes like hyperglycemia or hyperproteinemia, or as in our case, hypertriglyceridemia 
should always be excluded. Another thing is, when we are investigating hypertriglyceridemia, if there's a very high level, always we need to think of a primary cause either in the background or of a secondary disorder or, uh, or condition or either a standalone condition. So the primary causes are lipoprotein lipase deficiency, uh, APOC2 deficiency, and the list uh, goes on. So the, in the secondary causes, the commonest causes are obesity or metabolic syndrome and uncontrolled diabetes and also hypothyroidism and hypercorticosolemia. And also other diseases like liver disease and uh, in uh, other inborn errors like glycogen storage disorders and lipodystrophies, triglyceride levels can also be seen increased. And also we should always remember the drugs steroids, glucocorticoids, oral estrogens, and thiazides. So a few uh, points about lipoprotein lipase deficiency. It's caused due to the LPL gene defect, which is inherited in autosomal recessive pattern. And uh, uh, in this disease, the enzyme lipoprotein lipase is deficient, which usually catalyzes the chylomicron breakage uh, and uh, allows triglyceride to be uh, taken in. Uh, so the age of presentation, majority of the patient present uh, below in, in the infant stage and most by the age of 10 years. And the presentation depends on the degree of hypertriglyceridemia. So most uh, patients present with recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis and uh, if the levels are above 2000 milligrams deciliter, they can have irapa, and they can have hepatomegaly and splenomegaly, and also lipemia retinalis if the levels are above 4,000, and some are documented to have neuropsychiatric findings like mild dementia, depression, and memory loss. So another point in our case is uh, how to identify the lipemic samples. So the first one is visual assessment. But the problem with the visual assessment is uh, it's only visible if the triglyceride level is more than 3.4 in serum and in whole blood it should be more than 11.3. So the other method is uh, with use of lipemic index. So this is based on uh, the absorption spectrum of lipemia. As you can see, it shows a decrease in absorbance uh, starting from 300 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So manufacturers I use specific uh, bichromatic wavelength values after diluting the sample with uh, either water or normal saline. Uh, they get an absorption value and either give a direct quantitative measurement of, as, uh, for the lipemia or they give a semi-quantitative value as in our setting, which was an index. So the problem with lipemia is in, it interferes with most of the general chemistry analysis. This is due to either light scattering or the volume displacement effect or due to lack of sample homogenization. So this interference can cause biases, either negative or positive in the analysis. And uh, the problem with that is there are neither method nor analyzer specific in certain instances. and uh, uh, the other point is the biases, only some are bio, uh, significant beyond the clinical significant biases of the respective analytes. So uh, uh, based on a study previously done, they have analyzed how uh, certain analytes are affected by lipemia in three different analy uh, analyses. Uh, B stands for Beckman and R for Cobas and S for Siemens. And you can see that if you take albumin, uh, even at the same level of triglycerides, the bias, uh, one analyzer showed a positive one and other two ones, uh, negative bias. And uh, even across the levels of triglyceride levels, the bias doesn't seem to be following a certain pattern. Uh, I mean, it differs. So 
That's why we need to be avoiding lipemia interference when analyzing clinical chemistry analytes. So how to do that is uh, the gold standard is centrifugation method uh, by using ultracentrifugation. And uh, the second one is uh, using extraction methods like uh, using lipoclear. And the other one is dilution, which is the easiest accessible method for most laboratories. And also using alternative measurement methods like as we did uh, for the electrolyte analysis by using direct potentiometry. So the gold standard of uh, lipid removal is by ultracentrifugation. The main point here is the primary sample should the, the other analytes uh, should be analyzed after centrifugation at 10,000 RPM for 10 minutes. And uh, after doing that, the viscous fatty layer will ap uh, appear in the top. Then we have to carefully aspirate the infranet and uh, direct for analysis of the other analytes. So finally, the learning points of our case is uh, on the evaluation of hyponatremia, we have to always consider non-hypotonic causes of hyponatremia. And also in extreme hypertriglyceridemia, we have to think of primary causes and uh, also that lipemic interferences causes bias in general chemistry analysis. And these are neither analyzer specific. So we need to refer our manufacturer specifications on lipemia interference. And also we need to verify their data. And uh, also we need to identify lipemia and uh, apply methods of avoid avoiding lipemic interferences. So uh, that's the end of case, our case presentations. I'll hand over to our madam for the discussion. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Nishahani and Mika for selecting two cases of electrolyte abnormalities. I don't know some whether they also ended up in rare disorders. Right? So the investigation of hyponatremia can be challenging as you saw the two cases and appreciate that each pa patient case is different also. So need a systematic approach to avoid missing a diagnosis, and especially the uh, uh, observation of the samples uh, and uh, going through the clinical validation in a proper manner. So consider common disorders first while keeping mind the rare, rare ones at the bottom. So these two cases are also evident for our performance of basic clinical tests because we had a lot of problems with the second patient when the triglycerides were high and we had to do water centrifugation to give the proper results to the ward. Okay, so actually third case, of course, uh, the other compounds like chloride played a vital role. The second, the last case, the triglycerides played a big role. So, yes, so I would like to, now we have come to the uh, final stages of our session. So we all of us want to thank uh, the College of Chemical Pathologists for giving us this opportunity to share our experience. And I want to add a few statements. Thank you, Mika, Nishani, Kisanjali, and Tayani for keeping us in an elated mood today when adding final frills to the presentation today morning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for that very interesting case discussion series. So now the session is open for questions or any comments. I'll just check the chat box to see if we have received any questions. Can I ask one question about this? Hypertriglycemia, <clears throat> last patient, I think. With hyponatremia? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, who is this? Uh, I can't get your name. I forget your name. Well, this Mehika. Mehika. Uh, yeah. Mehika. What's your name, please? Mehika, madam. Mehika. Ah. Now you said that this uh, 
example was ultra centrifuge, no? Yes, madam. Where was this done? At the large uh, Do you have ultra centrifuge? Yes, madam. Uh, for the preparation of uh, samples for amino acid analysis, uh, uh, we have a micro centrifuge uh, which has the capacity of uh, centrifuge in at, at 10,000 to 20,000 RPM. So what was the speed you use for? 10,000 RPM for 20, 10 minutes. So if it doesn't uh, separate, uh, we, had to re we have to repeat the same, si another cycle. Uh, so you did two times? No, this one we only had to do once, madam. But uh, so did you have so triglyceride level before and after? No, madam. Uh, triglyceride levels we need to analyze prior ultra centrifugation because otherwise, since we are taking the infrared and uh, using for the analysis, if we are using the post centrifuge sample, so if you are measuring the triglyceride, uh, we uh, take the uh, the need sample prior centrifugation. Need sample. Yeah, to yes. prior, sorry, uh, uh, prior centrifugation. And so, how to analyze uh, what was uh, this patient's uh, triglyceride level? It came to around 47, madam. Uh, it exceeded <laughs> our linearity limit, madam. So, we had to perform dilution, madam. Manual. Uh -huh. So, what was the dilution? If I'm not the inquisitive, I'm just asking. Uh, yes, it's rather high. One in, uh, I think it was one in, uh, one in. 40, uh, 30 or something. I'm, I'm not sure actually. But the it is, do they allow that kind of? Uh, no, madam. Uh, it, it was beyond the uh, manufacturer recommended value uh, because uh, even uh, at the at the manufacturer uh, recommended highest value, it came as a more than value. So we had to go on a manual uh, dilution. So right. we issued the report saying as more than value. Just for mm -hmm. the presentation sake, uh, we gave. Ah, you did the, ah. The, yes. So then the this thing, I mean, the triglyceride level, they have been a bit uh, different. And the other thing is now, what was the diagnosis of this child? Uh, lipemia, uh, li uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency. Lipoprotein lipase. Can't it be a post C2 deficiency? Uh, it, uh, but, it you can be better because uh, high triglyceride with normal cholesterol and the child didn't have uh, any other so no, no, no. triglyceride uh, would have been due to lipoprotein lipase deficiency or uh, post C2 deficiency. Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, yes, ma'am. The genetic, uh, the overseas laboratory checked for a genetic panel involving uh, the causes of uh, primary hypertriglyceridemia, it, which included CP2, and uh, they didn't reveal a mutation but, in the, that category, ma'am. No, they, did they do the levels? Like, like no, this? madam. They didn't do the Just levels. Just mutation. All yes, right. Yes, By mutation, they excluded that. Yes, madam. All right. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. very interesting. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Present duty to thank those who contributed to make this case discussion a success. So firstly, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Iresha Jasingha, consultant chemical pathologist at Also, I would like to thank the two senior registrars, Dr. Mihika Fernando and Dr. Nishani De Silva, and the two registrars, Dr. Kishanjali Ranmutupura and Dr. Thayani for their excellent presentations. Also, I would like to thank our participants joining us with us from all over the country. So without your presence, this wouldn't have been a success. I thank all those who asked questions and made this discussion a fruitful discussion. So hope to see you all again in one month's time in a session like this. Thank you.
under the name of Bali. Okay.